We live in a society where with a basic internet connection and a microprocessor, you can teach yourself anything. And the process of teaching yourself a new concept is actually, it's a formal thing, it's called autodidacticism. But entrepreneurship itself, and not just learning these technical skills, is now transcending age and geographical constraints that once existed. This is leading to fast change in the ecosystem and the evolution of ideas. The innovation we see in technology today is actually largely down to the collaboration of individuals which are physically located in different parts of the world but are unified with the capability to share and discuss on the virtual medium of the internet. Today, I wanted to discuss my first-hand experiences in the technology industry when it comes to collaboration in two rather juxtaposed scenarios. The first being my time at the startup summary that I had founded, and the latter being my experiences over the last year or so at Yahoo and working with a team of people there at the, the large American internet company. So when I started my company, Sumly, I only had the technical knowledge that I'd managed to get just through online lectures, videos, PDFs, eBooks, etc. So I therefore realized I would need to quickly collaborate with some of the world's experts in the field of artificial intelligence so I could take the algorithm that I designed and really bring it to the next level. And the problem was I didn't really know anyone in technology and because I was only 15 at the time, I knew no one would really trust what I was doing. So I therefore decided to release a prototype of the idea because I realized that although it's very difficult to prove to someone the merit of your idea or application, when you actually go about making it tangible, it's easy for them to play with it and deduce from there. The app that I created called Trimit took long form articles and automatically summarized them into two to three bullet points. The app was actually quite simplistic but I worked very hard to ensure that the accuracy of the product was quite high and I'd worked on things like the design which people might not necessarily focus on in order to make sure that it was fairly evaluated against all the other applications. My first and I guess most important moment of collaboration came through the first contact I ever had with potential investors. They were actually the private fund of the Hong Kong billionaire Lee Ka Shing and they'd reached out to me on the back of the Trimit application I'd created and they were actually quite known for investing in artificial intelligence companies such as Siri, which was actually acquired by Apple about two years ago and is in the phone when you talk to it. So this was an example of virtual collaboration in which I was able to have a series of conversations with the team on the other side of the world about an eventual partnership and have hardly any disadvantage despite us being on the other side of the world. The use of video conferencing and the quick exchange of information allowed the process of negotiating contracts to actually be quite seamless and something of this manner would never have really been possible um, 10 to 15 years ago, let alone even five years ago before the inception of mobile phones. Uh, once I had taken the investment from Li Ka Shing's firm, the original the seed money, I then arrived at my next real challenge when it came to collaboration, which was to then go about building this team of experts who would help take the vision that we had and really bring it into reality. My approach to reaching out to these potential employees was very much ingrained in the notion of virtual collaboration. I cold emailed, so entirely out of the blue with no formal introductions, a few people who looked really excellent at graphic design from the work I could see on the, on the internet. One of the people who responded actually ended up becoming one of my main designers at Sumley. He was based in New York and originally from the Czech Republic but we were still able to synergize well using Skype and email, and we would periodically fly about once a month to each other's cities to ensure that we had a good working relationship. It is important to emphasize how few people actually responded to my emails at this stage. When I was looking for a head of science, so a PhD who was well known in the field of summarization, I probably sent an email to 100 or 200 different academics, and maybe received just two or three responses at best. However, the one person who did send me a nice response, so it so happened to be serendipitously, was actually one of the main experts in the field of summarization. He was a professor who'd written a lot of the literature in the 1990s on this field when it was still something that wasn't well known. And he was very excited by the fact that I was taking quite a dormant field, so something that hadn't really been worked on since the 1960s when it was really invented. And I was looking to commercialize that in a new way. He'd actually retired and was living in Thailand at the time. But through the powers of the internet, we were still able to strike that relationship and end up forming a, a working partnership, which um, he's still working at Yahoo today, so it's been going for a number of years now. 
My final notable experience of non-trivial collaboration at Sumley came from the partnership that I developed with the Stanford Research Institute, SRI. SRI was famous as being the inventor of the mouse long before Xerox PARC was, as well as working with the US military on a number of technical innovations, such as the invention of the original internet. It was quite interesting because at the time, I wasn't that well known in the academic community, but I really wanted to persuade their director of research at SRI that he should collaborate on the algorithm and product. I realized it was important to work with SRI at this point because the time frame that I was working with was that I wanted to release an application in a matter of months as opposed to years, which is a lot more seen traditionally in these artificial intelligence companies. So because of this urgency, I wasn't going to be able to hire a team all by myself. I would need to collaborate with these other groups that had been working with each other for decades. The director of research at SRI was enthused, and despite our virtual team being placed across the world in New York, London, Thailand, uh, even in Asia, we were able to work with SRI and get our product ready to launch in November of 2012. The launch was quite a success, and after a million downloads and around 100 million summaries being read by our users, I decided to sell Sumly to Yahoo in April 2013, so just over a year ago. Joining a large American internet company was actually very intimidating. Although we'd built a success with Sumly, I realized working at Yahoo was really going to be a step change in something very different. Again, I came across that geographical constraint with the center of gravity of the company of Yahoo being in Silicon Valley over in California, and me still being based in London and Europe. I owe an awful lot to their CEO, Marissa Meyer, for actually trusting me and taking a chance on allowing me to design a new product there despite the fact that geographically I was on the other side of the world. A month or two into joining Yahoo, I went about forming a team to build a new product based on Sumly that we wanted to launch to consumers across the globe in the coming months. The team ended up comprising of two designers, five engineers, two scientists, two editorial leads, and one or two other individuals. So it's quite small in, in terms of the industry. It's only about 10 people or so. But due to our varying backgrounds, we were able to brainstorm and come up with unique approaches to problems that hadn't really been solved in product management or within computer science. My role was to be the product manager and lead this team, but we took quite a liberal approach in allowing everyone to work at their own pace and trying multiple iterations before locking in any specific direction. We took around eight months in 2013 to build this product, and I ended up publicly launching it in January of this year at CES, so the, the, the show in Las Vegas, the Consumer Electronics Show, um, and the product was called Yahoo News Digest. So Yahoo News Digest is a very different approach. It's antithetical to what traditionally has been seen in news and information apps up until this day. Lots of these news apps focus on giving you infinite streams of information that go on forever. But this can actually be very overwhelming to the user because they could never get to the bottom and feel that moment of completion and accomplishment. Instead, our product, Yahoo News Digest, provides the users with two definitive digests, just two, that's it, in the day, of everything they should know about to be informed on current affairs. These digests are actually finite, and they tend to consist of an array of different topics, so things like business, sports, entertainment, health, lifestyle, and other things. But the stories, the articles themselves, aren't what you would usually expect when it comes to a news product. Instead of providing our users with thousands of words of text that are overloading and go on forever, we give our users just a summary of the storyline, which is compiled from multiple articles on the topic. We then give context to the story with units of information, these visual units of information that we call atoms, <coughs> which include maps, stock tickers, infographics, Wikipedia information, tweets. So we really do have this multimedia experience. At any point, if a user wishes, they can go read the original story and skip over this synthesized summary. Due to the temporal nature of the application, with there being just two digests a day, we don't expect our users to be on the app in between those timings. This actually is a constraint, has led to the creativity in the sense that people have now used this as a daily habit because they feel refreshed in the fact that, unlike all these other social media networks where there's just constant push notifications, it's actually quite calming, with there being a set time in which 8 a.m. and 6 p.m., in which you come into the product. I'm fortunate in the sense that because I joined Yahoo, you know, I had something to prove. And so it's nice to see that the product has had recognition uh, externally and internally within the company. Um, as you were saying, we did, we did with the Apple Design Award last month uh, in California. 
um, which was which was a nice which was a nice achievement. But what I'm really proud of is the fact that this new kind of product uh, has been recognised in the industry uh, as something that people might use in the future. We've also had a, a number of downloads, and we've garnered this. You see, the thing in technology is it's it's not really the volume of users, but it's how engaged they are. Do they come back every day? Are they a daily active user? And in the case of a product like this, because we focus so hard on those timings of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m., and we send notifications and remind the user, it really does form a habit. And one of Yahoo's main missions in their kind of corporate slogan is, you know, inspiring daily habits. And so this happened to be a bi-daily habit, but a, but a daily habit of that. So I now look forward to emulating these learnings uh, with other things in the future, um, and potentially other projects at Yahoo and beyond. But in conclusion, if you look at many great examples of collaboration, whether it be, for example, the Manhattan Project, the end of World War II, or Bell Labs in the 1960s, which was a famous innovation area in America in which the internet and a lot of information theory was created, or even Xerox Park, which did lead to the original graphical user interface and mouse, they do all share one common characteristic. And this characteristic is their interdisciplinary in nature. The finest work created usually comes from analogical reasoning, where a concept which is well known in one field is applied novelly to a problem in a completely separate domain and field. This is only possible if you have individuals from a wide array of academic disciplines, all convening and discussing the overlaps in their respective industries and working together to a common solution. My favorite and most modern day example of this happens to be an enigmatic hedge fund based out of New York called Renaissance Technologies. It was actually founded by a mathematician and a physicist, and the fund prides itself on hiring biologists, psychologists, sociologists, and experts in fields which are not traditionally associated with economics and making money. Their medallion fund regularly returns 2,000 to 3,000% over a 10-year cumulative period, making it actually one of the most successful hedge funds ever, although there is some verification needed there. I credit this success to an ingenious discovery, probably found by a few academics sitting in a room discussing a problem, but all from their varying backgrounds. I would encourage anyone in this room who has an idea, no matter how confident you are about it, to begin teaching yourself as much as you can about the field within it and immersing yourself. Then go build a prototype and collaborate with others, as even if it doesn't become a success, you'll learn a lot from it and gain confidence in the process. Thank you.